Hello, everyone. Welcome to the second lecture in kinetics. This time we're going to deal with uh, different reaction orders. We're going to show you how to uh, derive rate expressions from data. Now, there is no simple way to find a rate law from a chemical equation that you're looking at. Some equations look simple, and you might think that you can identify what the reaction orders are, but you really can't until you look at experimental data. Yeah, I'm gonna give you some examples here now of some fairly simple chemical reactions. Here we have dinitrogen pentoxide decomposing into nitrogen dioxide and oxygen gas. And if you take a look at the <clears throat> balanced equation here, we can see the relationship is one mole of reaction consumes two moles of N2O5, and the rate using the uh, coefficients in the balanced equation or for uh, <clears throat> factors, the coefficients, we can say the rate of reaction is one over minus two because the uh, correction factor is minus two here. So one over minus two D N2O5 DT, and that's going to equal some constant, K, times the concentration of N2O5. We don't know what the exponent is yet. You can't get the exponent from the balanced chemical equation. You have to use experimental evidence. So from experimental evidence, we can see here that this is first order with respect to the N2O5. Again, that didn't derive from the balanced equation. It derived from experimental evidence that we haven't seen yet. We'll get to that. So the first, it's first order overall based on this reaction expression. And the negative sign in this case simply means it's being consumed. The N2O5 is being consumed. And the weighting factor in this case for this particular reactant is minus two. Another chemical reaction involves the uh, breakdown of sugar using water. We're going to take uh, glucose and fructose in, in a molecule of sucrose. So we have sucrose, and we're adding water and decomposing the sucrose into glucose and fructose, which are isomers of each other, but different arrangements in space of the atoms yield totally different substances that are metabolized differently in the human body. Uh, recently, we have started demonizing fructose. Uh, we've identified that there are some, uh, some real consequences to eating too much fructose, particularly a high fructose corn syrup found in, in drinks. Um, so you want to stay away from any drinks that have large amounts of sugar in them, any kind of sugar, really. But fructose is particularly harmful, we've discovered. So now the rate of this chemical reaction is DC12H22O11 DT, and that equals a constant K times concentration of C12H22O11, the sucrose molecule. The negative again means the substance is being consumed. And we can't determine it just from this equation that the reaction is first order with respect to C12H22O11, but we have found it from experimental data that we haven't seen yet. So again, reaction is first order with respect to sugar, it was experimentally determined, it didn't come from the equation, the balanced equation, and it's first uh, order overall. Now note water doesn't appear in this expression because water is a different state in this case. It's liquid and its concentration is a constant, so it's not factored into the rate expression. It's, it's probable that the quantity of water doesn't really change the K value. So, because it is a constant. Now, what's interesting about first order reactions is they have the same reaction half life So we're gonna talk about what that means right now. So if you look, we have um, a graph that shows the change in partial pressure of a system over time. And we can see if we start with 800 as our partial pressure, of our substance, half of 800 is 400. Well, to get from 800 to 400 took 80 seconds, 80 minutes. And if we take a look at the, the curve, we can see from another 80 minutes, which is 160 minutes, it went from 400 to 200 millimeters of mercury pressure. 
Again, it decreased by half, 400 to 200. It took the same amount of time. And we could see the same thing in this third interval from the graph from 160 minutes to 240 minutes. Again, the substance decreased from 200 partial pressure, 200 millimeters of mercury to 100 millimeters of mercury. This is a characteristic of all curves that are first order. The half lives remain the same. And a half life again is the amount of time it takes for half the substance to disappear. So if I started with theoretically 800 molecules, after 80 minutes, there's only 400 molecules left. After another 80 minutes, there's only 200 molecules left. After another 100 minutes, there's only 100 molecules left. That's what the concept of a half-life is. And we can see that from the graph, this is a constant change that's happening here. It's independent of the initial concentration. So if we started with a different concentration initially, the curve would follow the same path, the half-life would be the same. This half-life is consistent on our graph of 80 minutes. So the first order reactions, again, are independent of the original concentrations we start with. For second and third order reactions, we don't have constant half times. So whenever you take a look at a curve that's representing a change over time in concentration of a reactant, if you see the half-life is the same along that curve, we can then uh, determine that that is in fact a first order reaction. If it's not, then it's not a first order. And there are other ways to figure out if they're second order, zeroth order, third order. And we'll look at those later. Here are some half-lives that we look at. Here's a half-life of acetic acid, also called ethanoic acid. It takes, as you can see, this reaction happens very quickly, but other reactions don't. For instance, uranium-238, which is a byproduct of uh, of nuclear explosions, we can see its half-life is 451 million years. Incredible long time for the decay of uranium-238. It means that if you started with a gram of it, after a 451 million years, there would be half a gram <clears throat> that is still left. That's why we are so... Uh, cautious with respect to certain radioactive materials because they have extremely long half-lives. If you have nuclear tests done where they inject nuclear material into your body so they can view systems in your body, like your heart, those substances are chosen to have half-lives that are relatively short so your body gets rid of that material very quickly. You don't want something with a long half-life entering your body, not in any significant quantity anyway because all the while it's decaying, it's releasing radiation that can be harmful to your cells. Second order reactions. We'll look at another example here. BRNO, which we've talked about before. BRNO decomposes to bromine and nitrogen monoxide, also called nitrogen two oxide, also called nitric oxide, three different names for this guy. The overall rate again, the factor here is minus two, the correction factor. So it's uh, one over minus two d b r n o d t, which equals the reaction constant K times the concentration of BRNO. This just happens to be the same number as this, but that's just a coincidence. That number was determined from experimental data, not from this equation. And the rate of BRNO from this data that we're given here is d b r n o over d t. It's minus two times the overall rate. So the overall rate of the reaction would be based on the substance present in one mole, which is the appearance of BR2. The rate of consumption of BRNO would be twice as great. And because it's consumed, we use a negative number. So this particular reaction, given this expression here, the rate expression is second order with respect to BRNO. And it's second order overall because there is only one reactant. Keep in mind these reaction kinetics always deal with the reactants. Another example, hypochlorite ion. Hypochlorite is ClO1 minus. It's the uh, substance found in bleach. It's also the substance found in what we call chlorine pucks, 
Most people think chlorine pucks are just chlorine. They're not. They're salts of hypochlorite, usually calcium hypochlorite or sodium hypochlorite. Well, this in this particular reaction, the hypochlorite ion acts as both an oxidizer and a reducer, and it, it changes into ClO3 minus, which is called um, chlorate ion, and it also releases two chloride ions. And that's the active substance present that cleans uh, pools. It oxidizes organic material that enters a pool, like leaves, like uh, wastes that come off of people's bodies, and effectively gets rid of it, keeping our, our pool kind of smelly, but at least uh, gets rid of bacteria and algae that can accumulate in the pool over time. You have to keep replacing it, of course, to continue its oxidative work. Now, experimentally, the rate expression was found to be, as you can see here, it's, it's one over minus three dCLO dt, which is equal to a constant K times a concentration of CLO. And from experimental data, we discovered it is a second order reaction, does not come from this balanced equation. So it, <clears throat> from the balanced equation, we could see three moles of hypochlorite ion is consumed per mole of reaction. Now, the reaction rate could be determined by looking at this, the chlorate, ClO3 minus, because it's present as one mole. We know that the consumption of ClO is three times as great. The weighting factor, again, for each of these, for, for hypochlorite ion is minus three, for chlorate it's plus one, and for chloride ion it's plus two. As I mentioned, the hypochlorite ion acts as both the reducing and oxidizing agent, and this particular reaction, because of the rate expression, is second order with respect to the hypochlorite ion, and it's second order overall because it's the only reactant. Another equation is the fluorination of NO2, nitrogen dioxide. We can fluorinate nitrogen dioxide and get this particular substance, NO2F. The overall rate is, again, the, the weighting factor for NO2 is minus 2. So it's 1 over minus 2 dNO2 dt, which is equal to minus dF2 dt. F2, is its weighting factor is minus 1 and the weighting factor of NO2F is plus two. Now, the expression for the, this particular reaction would be equal to a constant K, and experimental data was used to find out its first order with respect to NO2 and first order with respect to F2. Again, you can't get that from the balanced chemical equation. It has to come from experimental data. We'll be doing a bunch of those questions <clears throat> in a few minutes. So this reaction is first order with respect to both the NO2 and the F2. You derive that not from the balanced equation, but from the rate expression. And it's second order overall because we have to add the exponents. First order with respect to NO2, first order with respect to F2 gives you second order. A third order reaction could be the oxidation of NO, nitrogen, uh, two oxide or nitrogen monoxide or nitric oxide, three names for it. NO oxidizes to NO2, which is a brown gas. You'll sometimes see smog in the air. The smog that's brownish in color, that comes from the nitrogen dioxide or the nitrogen four oxide or the, uh, I guess, yeah, those two names correspond to NO2. Most, most frequently called nitrogen dioxide. And it's a brown gas, <clears throat> very unsightly, also uh, is, has a very pungent odor and actually can give you a choking effect if you breathe too much of it. Now the overall rate, the weighting factor for NO is minus two. So it's one over minus two dNO dt, which equals minus one DO2 dt, which equals a constant K times a concentration of NO times concentration of O2. Now the experimental data in this case looks like it yielded a, a rate expression that has the same numbers as in this 
overall balanced equation, which is just a coincidence. Other data must have been then analyzed to determine this rate expression. So this reaction is first order with respect to the O2, because the exponent is one. It's second order with respect to the NO. So what do you think the overall order is? I'm hoping you said, well, the overall order is three for this particular reaction. And this happens very slowly because the concentration of NO in the atmosphere, luckily, is extremely small. I also want to emphasize that there are sometimes orders of reaction that are non-integer. I'm going to give you an example of that. Phosgene, which was a poison gas developed for warfare in the First World War. It is extremely toxic. Notice it was produced by Fritz Haber, who was a German scientist, a German chemist. He also um, did a lot of good for the world when he came up with the uh, ability to produce ammonia from nitrogen and hydrogen. We talked about him, I talked about him in the first uh, lecture. Unfortunately, he also got swayed by the pol political situation at the time and he was employed by the Nazi by the Nazis during the war. Oh, sorry, the First World War, not the Nazis, just the Germans in the First World War. And he produced this toxic substance, phosgene. Phosgene, if you take uh, uh, C double bond O, if you take carbon monoxide, sorry, and you react it with chlorine gas, you end up with this nasty substance, which is C double bond O Cl on one side, Cl on the other. It's, it's really a, an aldehyde. It's a modified aldehyde and very, very toxic substance to breathe. When you breathe it, it decomposes in your lungs into carbon monoxide and chlorine. That has a very toxic effect I'll mention in a minute again. Well, the overall rate of this reaction is K times concentration of CO times concentration of Cl2 to the power of three halves. So it's, it's uh, first order with respect to carbon monoxide. It's three halves order with respect to Cl2. So when we add those up, we get the overall order, which is three halves plus two halves, which is five halves, which you could also express as 2.5. And again, mentioning that that FOS gene breaks down in your lungs, the chlorine, which reacts with uh, your lungs, the water in your lungs, it makes hydrochloric acid starts decomposing the tissues in the lungs. And the carbon monoxide, of course, is picked up by your hemoglobin in your blood supply. It displaces carbon dioxide and oxygen. It mainly, it uh, displaces oxygen from your uh, hemoglobin. So your body suddenly doesn't transport enough oxygen and you will lose consciousness if exposed to enough carbon monoxide. That's why we have detectors in our houses that detect the presence of carbon monoxide. If you ever wake up in the middle of the night with a really bad headache, you might wanna ask other members of your family if they have a headache as well. If they do, I would probably get out of the house uh, until you have it checked out because it could be due to a leak of carbon monoxide, which can happen in an inefficient furnace, particularly if a bird builds a nest in your chimney, it can stop the waste gases from escaping and they'll start building up in your house. There have been people that have died from this, so be very careful. Carbon monoxide detectors will usually pick it up, but who knows, your carbon monoxide detector might not be working. Be aware of that, please. Now, the production of phosgene for, for uh, war purposes, obviously, is not what engineers are all about. Engineers are about producing products that benefit mankind, Certainly, you don't want to engineer substances that are used to kill your fellow man. <clears throat> now, in summary, reaction rate expressions of different orders could resemble any of the following. It could be a zeroth order, in which case it's independent of the concentration of the reactants. The rate happens without any change caused by the change in the concentration of reactants. No matter what the concentration of reactants are, you're going to end up with the same rate. They can be first order, where the rate is dependent on the concentration of, of uh, the reactants to the power one. It can be second order, when it's proportional to the concentration of, of a reactant squared. Or it can be two reactants in a bimolecular interaction, 
and each one is to the power of one, the overall reaction rate would be two. And reactions are third orders. You can get different scenarios that produce third order reactions where you can either have one reactant uh, having an effect and the other one not, <clears throat> where it's, uh, it's third order with respect to one reactant. It can be first order with respect to one reactant and second order with respect to the other, or it can be first order with respect to three different reactants in a trimolecular reaction, which is kind of rare, but they do happen. Now, we're gonna determine the form of the rate law. So how do we experimentally determine the differential rate law for a chemical reaction? The most common method is to look at the initial rates of reaction at the start of, any, of a reaction. You're gonna determine the instantaneous rate just after the reaction happens, around time zero. And from that, we're going to deduce what the rate expression is. So in this method, again, we measure the initial concentration of the reactants, and we, we measure how much they change at the very beginning of the reaction. And we do several experiments where we change the initial concentrations of the reactants to look at the effect on the overall rate. And then we compare those results to determine how those initial rates depended on the initial concentrations that were present during the trials. So you're usually doing numbers of trials and keep in mind, alternatively, an initial rate can be determined by finding a slope of a tangent drawn at a point sometime after the beginning of the reaction. And we already discussed that in the first lecture. Now let's consider some examples here. Here we have a chemical reaction, hydrogen iodide decomposing into hydrogen and iodine. We're gonna look at data from three different experiments where you're comparing the initial rates. And we're gonna take a look at one trial, which was done with a concentration of hydrogen iodide at 5.0 times 10 to the minus three moles per liter. And we measured the overall rate of the chemical reaction which would be the rate at which hydrogen or iodine was produced at 7.5 times 10 to the minus four moles per liter per second. How do we know it's hydrogen or iodide? Because they're present in the quantity of one mole. The quantity of HI that's consumed would be twice as great as the quantity of H2 or I2 that's being produced based on the stoichiometry of this reaction. Well, one trial alone isn't enough. We have to do multiple trials and here's multiple trials. Now let's see if we can deduce what's going on here based on how the concentration of hydrogen iodide has changed the overall rate. You can choose any trials that you like <clears throat> when you're analyzing it to determine the overall rate law expression. And once we have the rate law expression, we can determine the reaction order with respect to the reactant. We are then going to calculate the rate constant and give its units, which can be tricky. Be very careful when you're expressing the units for rate constants there. They change all the time, dependent on the rate expression itself. And finally, we're gonna calculate the reaction rate for a concentration of 0 0.0020 mole per liter of hydrogen iodide. So those are the three things we're going to figure out based on this data. Let's go for it. Now, I always like looking at trials where the quantities are one and involve them. So I'm gonna solve initially for the first question, which is let's come up with a rate expression for, for this equation. Now we know the uh, nu is, is, the, is the number here, the weighting factor for hydrogen iodide for this reaction is minus two. We know the rate is going to be one over minus two d h i d over to t, which is k times the concentration of h i to the n. What we don't know is what n is at this point. So I'm going to look at trials, the second and third trials, also called trial B, trial C. And I'm going to put the biggest number on top. And I'm also going to, I like to use one in my in my analysis. So I'm gonna take two times 10 to the minus two divided by one times 10 to the minus two. That gives me an answer of two. And then I'm also going to divide the rates for those in the same order. If I divide two by one, I'm gonna divide 1.2 times 10 to the minus two 
by 0.3 times 10 to the minus two. I'm also gonna change the quantity here to make sure that the, the powers are the same. Or you can figure it out on your own using a calculator or whatever is simpler. I always do these in my head because the numbers are always simple whole numbers. So I'm gonna take the rate for trial C. I'm gonna divide by the rate for trial B. Then I'm gonna take the concentration uh, sorry, then I'm then because I know it's equal to K times the concentration of HI for trial C to the power N. And the rate for B is K times concentration of HI in trial B. Okay, these numbers here. And we know that's going to equal the concentration of HI in trial C divided by the concentration of HI in trial B raised to some power N. Doing the math, we get 1.2 times 10 to the minus two, the rate for C divided by the rate for B, rate for C divided by the rate for B. And then we're gonna make that equal to the concentration of HI trial C, 2.0 times 10 to the minus two moles per liter. We're gonna divide that by 1.0 times 10 to the minus two moles per liter. <laughs> and notice the units all cancel out here. And we're going to find what exponent that is. Well, hopefully you can see that 1.2 times 10 to the minus 2 divided by 0.3 times 10 to the minus 2. Well, 0.3 goes into 1.2 how many times? Four times. On the left side, you're going to get an answer of 4. And on the right side, you're going to get, well, 2 divided by 1. They're both 10 to the minus 2. You're going to get an answer of 2. Well, two raised to what power gives four? Well, it seems to me two squared equals four. We have now determined what the order is for this particular reaction with respect to the HI. The rate is second order. The rate expression is R equals K, concentration of HI squared based on the data in this table. Second thing we're going to do is calculate the rate constant and give its units. Well, to do that, we're going to rearrange this equation. K must equal the rate divided by the concentration of HI squared. And we can use the data from any of these trials. And I recommend picking the trial that's got the simplest data. In this case, you got a one here. So why don't we use the data from, from B to answer our question about what K is. K is equal to, again, the rate. Well, the rate is 3.0 times 10 to the minus 3 moles per liter per second. We're going to divide that by 1.0 times 10 to the minus 2 moles per liter squared. Most common mistake I see students make is they forget to square it. Well, when you square what's one times 10 to the minus two squared, it's one times 10 to the minus four. So one times 10 to the minus four divided by 10 to the minus three is 10 to the power of one. 10 to the power of one times three is 30. That part is simple. <clears throat> Again, I like to do these in my head if I can. You do them whatever way you're comfortable with. Now, what's really tricky here is the unit. And you can either use dashes in the units or you can just put everything in the numerator. In this case, since the mole per second is on the bottom, I would write this as mole to the minus one, liter to the plus one, second to the minus one. That's an, another unit that is equivalent to this unit. Now, how do I get that? Well, I can see on the top, I have a mole per liter. On the bottom, I have a mole per liter squared. When I divide a mole per liter to the power of one by a mole per liter squared, don't I end up with a mole per liter to the minus one? Because it's one take away two, which gives you minus one. So a mole to the minus one, a liter to the plus one, and second to the minus one, or liter per mole second. That is the unit for K. Typically, when I mark these, I give a mark for the numerical part of the answer and a mark for the unit. So if you don't get the unit right, you lose a full mark. The third part of the question asks you to calculate the reaction rate for 0.0020 mole per liter, concentration of 
hydrogen iodide. We know the overall rate is 30 liters per mole second <clears throat> times the concentration squared, because that's the rate expression that we calculated. Here it is. We're going to take the 1.2 times 10 to the minus 4 mole per liter second, which we derive from multiplying the, from squaring this quantity, multiplying by 30. And that gives us the rate of consumption of HI. So the rate is, again, the, uh, the factor here is minus one. So it's one over minus two because hydrogen iodide is consumed at twice the rate. So it's going to be 1.2 times 10 to the minus four moles per liter second. <clears throat> and when we get this, keep in mind, this is the equation for the overall rate of reaction. The overall rate of reaction can be thought of as the rate at which one mole of product is made. Well, in this case, hydrogen iodide is being consumed at twice the rate. And it's being consumed, so we're going to use a minus sign to indicate the quantity. So the overall rate of reaction, there it is. And we know the rate at which hydrogen iodide is consumed is twice as much. It's minus 2.4 times 10 to the minus 4, using the weighting factor minus 2. So be careful when you're answering these particular questions, that you're looking at overall rate versus the rate for a particular reactant or product. And again, when you solved it, you got the overall rate. We want the rate of consumption of hydrogen iodide, which was what we were asked to calculate. <laughs> Second example, consider this reaction. Dihydrogen phosphite is the name of this particular ion. It's present in a lot of buffers, which we will analyze in acid-base equilibrium. Well, this particular ion can react with hydroxide ion. When it reacts with hydroxide ion, it produces monohydrogen phosphate and hydrogen gas. The experimentally determined rate expression was derived from looking at data, much like the last question we did from a table. In this question, I'm not asking you to come up with this rate expression. You're given it. And now you're asked to find what's the reaction order with respect to the hydroxide ion. The power of the hydroxide ion in the rate expression is two. So it's second order with respect to the hydroxide ion. And the overall rate, well, it's second order with respect to hydroxide first order with respect to dihydrogen phosphate. So it's going to be triple, three. And then the third question, what would tripling the dihydrogen phosphate concentration do at a constant pH to the reaction rate? And what would changing the pH from 13 to 14 do to the reaction rate if the quantity of H2PO2 remains constant. So I think I've already given you some of those answers, but let's continue because it's fairly straightforward here for the first two questions. Reaction order is two for the hydroxide. As I've said before, the overall reaction order is two added to one, the uh, exponent for the dihydrogen phosphate. And if I triple the rate, <clears throat> what will happen if I triple the concentration of H2PO2, what will happen to the rate? Well, this reaction order is one with respect to H2PO2, the dihydrogen phosphate. If I triple it, that means this is gonna be three times as greater. Three to the power of one is three. So the rate is tripled. Now D is a little trickier. Recall that the pH scale is a logarithmic scale. A change in pH from 13 to 14, in effect, increases the quantity of hydroxide ion by a factor of 10, not one. So pH 14 is 10 times more basic than pH 13. The quantity of hydroxide ion is gonna go up by 10. Well, if I take a look at this rate expression, if I increase this by 10 while keeping that constant, 10 squared is 100. The overall rate is going to go up by 100 
10 squared. Let's look at the third example. Familiar reaction. The initial rate was collected. Now, this question is a little different than the previous because there's two substances that are affecting the rate. It makes sense when you're doing a controlled experiment where you're looking at two variables that can affect the rate. The only way of knowing how one variable affects the rate is to look at a, a situation where only one of the rates is changing. And that's going to be the key to unlocking the rate expression based on this data. I'm going to focus on trials. There are three trials in this case. So we're going to focus on the trials where one changes and the other doesn't. And then from that, we're going to determine the rate expression where we can figure out the rate constant. And then we can figure out the rate of production of NO2 if the NO is given and the quantity of O2 is given as those quantities shown in the question. So first things first, let's analyze the data. Like a little puzzle here, three trials. I can arbitrarily call them trial A, trial B, trial C. We know that the rate is going to be equal to some constant K, which we're going to figure out what it is, but we don't know what it is yet, times the concentration of NO to the power of N, times the concentration of O2 to the power of M. So we're trying to find out what both N and M are. And we're going to have to do a couple of trials to figure this out. So as I said, we're going to look at two experiments where one of the concentrations is constant. Well, A and B looks like the concentration of NO is constant. So the change in the rate must be due to the change in the O2 when we compare A and B. Similarly, when we compare B and C, we can see that the rate change had to have been due to the change in NO because the O2 concentration stayed the same. So I'm going to compare B and C to figure out the effect that NO has. And I'm going to compare A and B to see the effect that O2 has. And when I figure out how NO affects it, I know what N is. When I figure out how O2 affects it, I'm going to know what M is. That's how I calculate the rate expression. So I use little brackets here to show you what I'm focused on right now. I'm going to take the rate from trial B. Why did I put B on top? Because it's a bigger number. That's the only reason. And I'd rather deal with whole numbers than fractions. So I'm going to take the rate of B and divide it by the rate of A. And then I'm going to know that the equation is K, concentration of NO from trial B to the power of N, concentration of O2 for trial B, for O, sorry, O2, yeah, trial of M. And we're going to divide it by the same rate expression, but for trial A. Well, a lot of canceling happens. We can cancel out the Ks and the concentrations because they're all the same. But NO, O2, on the other hand, switches. So there should be a little two here, by the way. I'll correct that, but for today. Taking the rate of B <clears throat> for trial B, the rate, sorry, in trial B, I should have said, is 8.4 times 10 to the minus six moles per liter per second. We're gonna divide that by the rate from trial A, 2.8 times 10 to the minus six moles per liter per second. And we know that's going to equal the concentration of O2. Okay, which is 3.0 times 10 to the minus 4 moles per liter per second, divided by 1 times 10 to the minus 4 moles per liter per second. And we can solve this. When we take a look, 2.8, 8.4. Let's divide them. Looks like this is three, looks like three eighths of 24, three twos is six, that's 8.4, right? So I don't need a calculator, I can see that's three. Three times 2.8 is 8.4, three times one is three. Well, it looks like the reaction order is simply one. Why? Because when we do the math, we're gonna figure out what this exponent is. We're gonna have a base of three equals a base of three, three equal to three, well, what power is going to fit? Well, M 
is one. So three to the power of one equals three, which I could have figured out just by looking at the data. I'm showing you how in written form as an engineer, it's important that you be able to, cal to communicate how you arrived at an answer to someone who doesn't understand what it, you're doing. That's why we go through this process. We've only solved for half of the rate expression at this point. We figured out what M is. Now let's look at what N is. How does NO affect the rate? We want to look at two trials where NO changed, NO2 stayed the same. So that's why we're looking at trials B and C. We're going to follow the same process. So we get the rate from trial C, 3.4 times 10 to the minus 5. We're going to divide that by 0.84. Notice I put those initial rates in the same exponent to be able to compare. Because 0.84 goes into 3.4 how many times? And we're going to do the same with the concentrations that did change for the NO. It, doing them in the same order, 2.0 2 times 10 to the minus 4 divided by 1. Well, that's equal to 2. Well, is this 2 times bigger? Well, 2 times 8 is 16. No. What about 4? Because 2 to the power of 1 is 2. 2 to the power of 2 is 4. We're after the exponent, remember. 4, 4 is 16. 4, 8 is 32. 33. Point, yeah, it looks like it's... I figured out what my base is. Because this works out to be 2. 2 raised to what power gives you 4? This is 4 times bigger. 4, 4 is 16. 4 is 32, 35. Approximate. So you get... Our rate expression, we figured out what M was in the first series of trials. M was one. Figured out what N was for the second series of trials. We figure out it's two. The reaction order, second order with respect to NO, first order with respect to O2. We are now poised to be able to solve for K. We rearrange this equation. K equals the rate divided by NO squared, divided by O2. Again, you can use either of these trials, but to me, why wouldn't you use the first trial A? The numbers there are ones. It's much easier to work with ones than it is to work with numbers that aren't one. So I'm gonna use the first trial, trial A. And I'm gonna substitute those values in. I'm gonna substitute the initial rate in, the concentration of NO, and I'm gonna square it. Concentration of O2 to the power of 1. And we end up with an answer of 2.8 times 10 to the power of 6. The unit is a little bit tricky. Again, we're taking the rate, which is moles per liter per second. And we're dividing it, in this case, by a mole per liter cubed. So a mole per liter cubed, remember, and a mole per liter to the power of one. Well, that looks to me like it's a mole per liter to the power of minus two, which when I bring it up, it could be mole to the minus two, liter to the plus two, second to the minus one. Or I could express it as liter squared divided by mole squared second. They are the same unit. Practice those, if you will, because again, a full mark for the unit, a full mark or the numerical answer. Are we finished? No, there's another part to consider. And I've seen students on midterms and finals forget to do the third part of a question because they're just so focused on the question and they're anxious and they wanna move on to the next question. Please double check. I see that I have to still figure out the rate of production of NO2. And look at the rate of reaction for NO2. It looks like the correction factor is two compared to the overall rate. The overall rate is what we know. The overall rate is based on the reaction as written, one mole of the reactant as written. So it would be the overall rate would be the same as the rate of consumption of O2, but the rate of NO2 produced is twice that. So be careful, okay? Let's continue the overall rate. We plug in our number for K. We plug in the quantities given. Please make sure you remember to square the concentration of NO times the quantity of O2. If your unit for your K is the correct unit, 
you know that the rate is moles per liter per second. Don't just assume. This is where you can double check to see if you've done the question correctly. And also remember, the overall rate is the rate at which O2 was consumed because it's present as one mole. The rate of NO2 production is twice as great. When we find the answer, <clears throat> we now know the rate of production of NO2 is 5.0 times 10 to the minus two moles per liter second of NO2 produced. Now I've created a worksheet and I've, I'm gonna put these on our OnQ website. If you're the type of person that likes to practice these questions, I know some of you did these in high school and you probably mastered them, but some of you might never have seen these types of questions before. So I put a question, I put eight different questions on here. And this is just kind of a, shows you a snapshot of the first half of the first page. And what I'm asking you to come up with is the rate expression based on this data. So these are all overall rates and they vary depending on the concentrations of A and B, which are the reactants. And each of these questions, we're always dealing with A and B and different rates for different concentrations. And you can check the answers the answers are on the sheet that follows. Here are the answers. But please do the questions first. The answer, I apologize, I didn't, uh, I didn't <clears throat> bother to uh, superscript these numbers, so, but you can still see your answers. So I, I give you the value of K, R equals K, concentration of A, so it's second order with respect to A, second order with respect to B, all right, for this question when you figure it out. So if you need the practice, have fun. And until next time, stay safe, work hard, and you shall be rewarded. For now, I bid you farewell until the next time.